Tonight, she went to jail a decade ago for the death of a child in her care. Now, a panel of judges declares that conviction a miscarriage of justice. The damage has been done, and it's irreparable. There's nothing that they could do to give back her life. How the Fifth Estate found the facts that changed it all. The Americans turning north for a popular prescription. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm stealing medication from people that need it, but I also feel like I'm a person that also needs it. Why Canadian pharmacists say that is an issue. And the small seaside community set to launch into space. Now, in what will be a first for Canada, we're finally about to do it. Get ready for liftoff. But will it fly? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, an admission that a woman who was jailed for the death of a toddler she was babysitting should not have been convicted. An admission that comes a decade late. Today, the B.C. Court of Appeal quashed the conviction that sent Tammy Bouvet to jail for a year. Her appeal and today's ruling was set in motion by the CBC's Fifth Estate. Their investigation revealed that a key piece of information was withheld from Bouvet's defense team. Mark Kelly has been on this investigation for years now. He shows us how her conviction changed her life forever and why the courts now call this case a miscarriage of justice. That was Tammy Bouvet in 2012, charged with second-degree murder after the child she was babysitting, 19-month-old Ayanna Teeple, drowned in a bathtub. I love that little girl like my own. It's a horrible thing happened, and then I get charged with something like this. There's no justice. The RCMP saw no foul play, but the case changed after the medical examiner, Dr. Evan Matches, said he saw extensive bruising on the girl, which he determined was typical of abused children. Bouvet pleaded guilty to criminal negligence and told the Fifth Estate that was to avoid a possible life sentence for murder. What her defense didn't know was a panel of experts had determined Dr. Match's conclusions about what happened in this house were unreliable, and that was never disclosed to Bouvet's lawyers. That expert report has since been set aside by the courts, and today's decision makes clear the court was not evaluating the work of Dr. Matches. Still, Bouvet's lawyers argued she would not have pleaded guilty if she had known about the undisclosed report. Now the B.C. Court of Appeal is calling her conviction a miscarriage of justice. The B.C. Prosecution Service admits mistakes were made and lessons have been learned, but stops short of an apology. Unfortunately, from Tammy's perspective, it doesn't really matter what the B.C. Prosecution Service does moving forward because the damage has been done and it's irreparable. There's nothing that they could do to give back her life. In 2020, the Fifth Estate unearthed that expert report supporting Bouvet's innocence. But by then, Bouvet was homeless, struggling with drug addiction, her four children taken from her custody. I got put in a category, which I'm not. What category is that? I am not a baby killer. So, Mark, what was Tammy Bouvet's reaction to this court ruling today? Well, in short, Adrian, we don't know. In fact, we don't even know if she knows about today's decision. For years, Tammy has been living in and out of shelters in New Westminster, B.C. Uh, her life has been in a downward spiral. We spoke to her lawyers who said they've spent days trying to track her down but have been unsuccessful so far. But they assure me they will track her down and they assure me they have some legal advice for her at the same time. They think that she should file her own lawsuit and sue the B.C. government for compensation. All right, Mark Kelly, thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Part of a large subdivision under construction north of Toronto is in ashes tonight after a major fire tore through the site. So that's the view from above. It shows the scope of the destruction. Fire officials say about 20 homes burned down, 15 were damaged by the heat. This is a big event. Uh, just because of the location, um, the density of the homes and the wind. The weather uh, was a factor today. There were no reports of injuries. The cause of the fire is under investigation. The cost of borrowing money in this country is holding steady tonight. Today, the Bank of Canada held its key interest rate at 4.5%, but that is still a 15-year high. And the signal from the central bank is that that rate could stay that high for months to come. As Nisha Patel tells us, that's news that hits home. 
Eddie Coe is shopping for a new mortgage. They are a bit more than what I expected. Since he bought his condo five years ago, interest rates have soared. Now he's up for renewal and expects his monthly payments could go up as much as $800 a month. We saw the rates went up and up and up and our hearts were just like, well, having heart attacks at that time. He's thinking about driving Uber to earn some extra cash and pinching his pennies to pay the bills. We are cutting costs um, from our food, cutting costs on our entertainment expenses. Um, anything that we can see, we can save. But less spending is just what the Bank of Canada ordered to slow the economy and cool inflation. On that front, the central bank says it's winning. From a peak of 8.1 percent last June, inflation has now fallen to 5.2 percent. The bank forecasts a drop to 3 percent by this summer. Our message is plan for inflation to coming back, come back down, plan for price stability. Still, the bank expects it will take until the end of next year to get back to the target of 2 percent and urge Canadians to be prepared. It may be necessary uh, for interest rates to stay elevated for longer to get that job done. Despite those higher interest rates, the economy has proven resilient. And experts say the prospect of interest rate cuts this year is unlikely. They are not going to be in a hurry to cut them when inflation is still above uh, its target. Co plans to lock into a fixed rate mortgage, so at least he knows the payments won't go any higher. It's just living day by day, uh, paycheck by paycheck. Um, there's no way for us to save any more extra money. A tough decision many Canadians will face in the months ahead. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Households in the U.S. may be feeling some relief tonight after inflation eased south of the border. Driven by cheaper gas and food prices in March, inflation there fell to 5 percent. That is below what was forecast, but the Federal Reserve is still expected to hike interest rates again next month. The U.S. is also proposing strict new rules that will boost the number of electric vehicles on the road. As Katie Simpson tells us, this is a move that could transform the auto industry on both sides of the border. Gas-powered vehicles are poised to be phased out as the Biden administration makes an aggressive push to go green. I say that folks should fasten their seatbelts because this electric future is taking off. The Environmental Protection Agency is proposing strict new regulations for tailpipe emissions and for automakers to meet the standards, roughly two-thirds of all new auto sales will have to be electric by 2032. This policy is going to go a long way to getting us towards our goals to get to net zero. Environmental groups are largely welcoming the plan, and so is Ottawa. Canada is moving strongly in the same direction, says a statement from the Minister of Environment and Climate Change's office. Traditionally, Canada adopts the EPA's emissions requirements after they are finalized. Though Canada has set a higher target, aiming for 82% of all light-duty vehicle sales to be zero-emission vehicles by that same deadline. The most important thing here for Canada is to continue to align with the U.S. EPA. If these goals are to be reached, it will require massive infrastructure investments in both countries. As it stands right now, we do not have nearly enough charging infrastructure to accommodate more electric vehicles on the road. There's also preparing power grids to handle increases in demand. Automakers have to be able to scale up production. And then there's the price tag for consumers. Electric vehicles are generally more expensive. The EPA believes it can be done. What we're looking at is a ramp up period. We know uh, that in the next couple of years, we're going to see uh, automobile manufacturers offer a suite of products that will be attractive to consumers. Some American auto workers unions have previously raised concerns this could kill jobs since these kinds of operations require fewer people. For now, the UAW says it will study the proposals carefully. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Justin Pearson, one of two Tennessee Democratic lawmakers expelled from the state legislature last week, is heading back. 
Today, Memphis officials voted he be reinstated. Pearson and Representative Justin Jones were expelled for taking part in a protest. They were calling for stricter gun controls after a mass shooting left six dead, including three children. Jones was reappointed to the State House on Monday. Thousands of federal government workers here are a step closer to the picket line tonight. The union says their members voted overwhelmingly in favor of a strike. Marina von Stackelberg now on the issues and the implications. I want to thank everyone for, uh, for being here. The Public Service Alliance of Canada says 155,000 civil servants are ready to strike. An overwhelming majority of our members have told us they can't wait any longer and they are prepared to strike to secure a fair deal. Some of them are deemed essential. They won't be allowed to walk off the job. But the union says 100,000 others can. Our members don't take the decision to strike lightly. They know that a strike will be difficult for them and for the Canadians who depend on the services they provide. A strike may slow down government benefits for everyone from farmers to veterans. Immigration and passport applications may be delayed. Canada Revenue employees are also threatening to strike. As the tax deadline looms, Ottawa warns it may be slow to issue tax returns. Obviously, we're uh, looking very closely to ensure that we continue to deliver the important services that uh, Canadians rely on the federal government for. Ottawa says it's made significant headway in negotiations over the last week. At the crux of the fight, wages. The union says most employees make between forty and $65,000 a year. We have some of the lowest paid workers within the federal public service. And those workers are currently relying on food banks in order to feed their families. The union also wants remote work written into their collective agreement. It comes as the federal government has been pushing employees to return to the office in a hybrid model two to three days a week. Our members have proven that they can be as effective working remotely as when they are in the office. The federal government says it's committed to reaching an agreement that is fair to employees and reasonable for taxpayers. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. This is night one in this country for more than 300 Afghans who arrived on a flight earlier today. Canada has now resettled 30,000 Afghans fleeing the Taliban, but the promise was 40,000 in return for the help given to Canada's mission in Afghanistan. Rafi Bujikanian shows us the mounting desperation for those still waiting. 15 hours from Islamabad to Toronto, but many of these 350 migrants fled Afghanistan more than a year ago after the Taliban took over the country in 2021. They sought temporary refuge in Pakistan and waited for Canada to process their immigration paperwork. It has been uh, a long time. We applied. This former construction contractor with the Canadian military is still waiting. 15 months now, he says. He's in Islamabad, desperate to avoid the Taliban's crosshairs. He knows from past experience they're out for blood. We have survived many suicide attacks uh, on the road. CBC News is protecting his identity because he fears for his safety. Recently, the Taliban captured one of his friends in Afghanistan and got their hands on the aid worker's phone where messages from the would-be Canadian migrant were saved. We were doing an like, uh, uh, education campaign in remote villages in Afghanistan. Just one type of challenge faced by Afghans waiting in Pakistan. Then there are the issues once they get to Canada, says this immigrant services provider. Affordable housing is, is a big challenge for refugees, especially the refugees who come our organization sponsorship. Hey From the federal government, a promise it won't leave people behind. We committed in uh, one of the most generous uh, targets of any country around the world uh, to repatriate, uh, to bring to Canada 40,000 uh, vulnerable Afghans, and we will continue uh, to be there to support people as much as possible. About a third of the Afghans who arrived Wednesday will be temporarily housed by the government as refugees, another third have private sponsorships, and the remainder will reunite with relatives already settled here. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. There are fears tonight that Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is slowly being poisoned while in prison. 
A spokeswoman says Navalny has been rapidly losing weight and became seriously ill on Friday. She believes he's being given low-dose poison. A longtime crusader against corruption, Navalny nearly died in 2020 from exposure to a nerve agent, which he blamed on the Kremlin. In Northern Ireland, U.S. President Joe Biden is marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. That peace accord largely ended conflict known as the Troubles. But as Susan Ormerson shows us, for all the progress made, divisions remain. The first U.S. presidential visit in a decade drew the crowds. It's great that the president of the free world is coming to Belfast just for a brief visit. Do you think it helps peace here? Oh, for goodness sake, yeah. Joe Biden spoke to a new generation at Ulster University, imploring them to keep the peace and reap the dividends. The so simple truth is that peace and economic opportunity go together. Peace Promising and investment and jobs in a stable Northern Ireland. There are scores of major American corporations wanting to come here, wanting to invest. Belfast streets near the new university used to be a fighting field. Deadly sectarian battles between mainly Catholics and Protestants, nationalists and unionists. The Good Friday Agreement brought an end to the worst of the violence 25 years ago. To those whose tools are bombs and bullets, your way is not the right way. But now, with recent attacks on police and a political impasse paralyzing the assembly, Tensions are rising. Northern Ireland will not go back, pray God. In spite of an end to the troubles and the relative peace here in Belfast, these walls still stand, kilometer after kilometer, still dividing Catholic communities from Protestant ones. There's approximately 70 of these walls, barriers, fences, structures that separate the two communities. 97% um, of social housing in Belfast is segregated Catholic or Protestant. For Johnny Byrne, Biden's visit is a reflection on the last 25 years, but importantly, a focus on how much more needs to be done. We still define people by that question. Are you British or are you Irish? The reality is, is that the wall could come down tomorrow, but all these issues that impact on people are still going to be there. And after Biden left Belfast, the gates between those neighborhoods shut tight like they do every night, a reminder of the imperfect peace here. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Belfast. After months of speculation, Buckingham Palace has confirmed Prince Harry will be at the coronation of King Charles next month. However, his wife Meghan will not be there. The palace says she will remain in California with their children. The coronation will take place May the 6th at Westminster Abbey. Now, some pharmacists are worried that Canada may run short of a popular drug to treat diabetes. We just don't have enough uh, in Canada to supply a market that's almost 10 times our size. How Americans are getting Ozempic here and what it could mean for this country's supply. Next. And renters hoping just to look at a new place are asked for some deeply personal information. My daughter's full name. They also ask for their birthdays my scene number, driver's license. And the Toronto teen, now Scrabble champion, with her pro tips. My second tip would probably to be to just develop your anagramming skills. We're back in TWO. That massive fire is burning at a plastic recycling plant in Indiana. It's been burning since Tuesday. More than 1,000 people have been forced from their homes because of that thick, toxic smoke. Officials say the flames could last for days still, and they warned of potential dangers. These are very fine particles, and if they're breathed in, can cause all kinds of respiratory problems. If you can uh, see the smoke, you're in the smoke, get out of the smoke. Federal and state regulators are also assessing, of course, the environmental impacts around the site. Canada's pharmacists have a new warning tonight about protecting this country's drug supply. Recent demand for the diabetes drug Ozempic has sent thousands of doses to the U.S. 
And as Allison Northcott explains, that has experts calling for more oversight. It was going to cost me around $1,000 um, here in the U.S. to purchase this medication. So. Amber Barr has been documenting her weight loss from the diabetes drug Ozempic on social media. My insurance also does not cover this, so I do have to order my meds from Canada. I'm Showing her American followers how they can order Ozempic from Canada, too. Barr says her insurance won't cover the cost because she's pre-diabetic, so she uses an online service to get a prescription from a doctor she never met and medication delivered from Canada for a lower price. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm stealing medication from people that need it, but I also feel like I'm a person that also needs it. Adults lost up to 14 pounds. Ozempic has become increasingly popular for weight loss, but with shortages and high prices in the U.S., Americans are getting it here. We just don't have enough uh, in Canada to supply a market that's almost 10 times our size. B.C. is limiting exports of Ozempic over fears of a possible shortage. A U.S.-based doctor recently had his Canadian license suspended after thousands of prescriptions written for patients in the U.S. were filled in B.C. There isn't really anything in place to stop it at the moment. This doctor um, in Maine also has a Canadian medical license, but says so far he hasn't used it to help Americans get Ozempic from Canada. Local mom-and-pop pharmacies along the Canadian border are Happy to get, have someone walk in and give them a handful of cash to take uh, a medication that then they're going to take back across this, the border into the United States. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a big issue. Patented drugs are often cheaper in Canada because prices here are regulated by a drug review board, unlike in the U.S. What we're seeing is people having gaps and finding ways to access it. And the reason that we're worried about these non-traditional pathways of access is because... Oh. Prescription drugs, we always want to weigh whether you have a benefit that outweighs the risk of using a drug. So, Allison, it sounds like all this has Canadian pharmacists calling for some action. Well, here in Canada, the main concern is around possible shortages. And the Canadian Pharmacists Association says that its focus is really on protecting the Canadian drug supply for Canadians. And that's not just for Ozempic, but it says that the scale of the demand for Ozempic is really shining a spotlight on this issue. And it says that the federal government and the provinces really need to find a way to keep that supply here in Canada for Canadians. And the Health Canada says that it is monitoring that supply for Canadians and that for now, there is enough for those who need it. All right, Alison Northcott, thank you. Now to something else that's in high demand and short supply, rental units. In an at least one province, we're hearing that tight rental market is leading to some pretty unusual demands from some landlords. Here's Julia Wong. Jump here. This cramped hotel room is home for Vanessa C. while she looks for a place to rent for her family. She says the search has been tough and invasive. Our full name, my daughter's full name. Uh, they also ask for their birthdays. Um, my scene number, driver's license. Uh, they ask for your vehicle's plate number. And that's not to rent a place, but simply to view it. C says she gave that information in hopes it would help her land a place to live. Right now, I feel very desperate um, to find a place for my family. She is not alone. So we're being asked for a uh, social insurance number, our banking information, like account details. The women say they were told the details were needed to verify their identity and weed out potential bad tenants. And when they don't share it... Usually is no contact after that so they won't continue setting up a viewing. Organizations might be trying to take advantage of the situation. Even in a tight rental market, this privacy expert says it's unreasonable to ask for that information just to view a property. They could take on your identity. They could use it for nefarious purposes. They could try opening credit cards in your name. MacArthur says renters have a couple of options. They could say no when asked for that personal information, he says they could also complain to their provincial or territorial privacy commissioner. But he says that complaint process may take some time, longer than most renters may have. Those who work with landlords say it's inappropriate to ask for that much information, but say they may be trying to safeguard their properties. I can imagine perhaps some folks uh, or individuals are um, quite nervous. They're overprotecting themselves by asking too much information too early in the process. As for C, 
this room may be home for a long time. It's very frustrating, very frustrating and sad um, to live in a hotel. <laughs> Julia Wong, CBC News, Calgary. Artificial intelligence is quickly advancing across every part of our lives, including the way we shop. The internet is very angry at this model. Companies are swapping humans for robots to model their clothes. Is this a bit of a slippery slope? Who has the right to control the identities that these AI models will represent? And get ready for liftoff. The startup hoping to make Nova Scotia the next Cape Canaveral. But is there room for more rockets? Globally, we were launching maybe 100 satellites a year, and now it's, it's more than 1,000. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Have a quick look at these recent ads. What do you see? Beautiful models selling jeans. Maybe you wouldn't normally give any of this a second glance, but let's look more carefully because no one in these pictures, not a single soul, is human. All of these people were created by artificial intelligence. An entire Levi's campaign of models without paying for models. And the internet seems annoyed. The internet is very angry at this model. It's not the only campaign giving this a go and just maybe this is the future. Artificial intelligence so woven into our lives we don't even notice it. So the conversation about AI often starts with the novelty of chat GPT. We talk a lot about that, but there are more subversive ways AI is creeping in. And just because you don't always recognize it doesn't mean it's harmless or has no consequences. So let's pull back this curtain a little bit. What is happening? What do we need to think about? Sinead Bovell is a former model and current futurist. I have a lot of questions about that job. And Joshua Bengio is a Canadian computer scientist, one of 20,000 tech leaders who signed a letter calling for a pause in AI development so the world can talk about how to regulate this space. I want to get to that in a moment. But if we can start with these AI models, these, these AI avatars. Sinead, forgive me here, but beyond actual people losing work, what's the problem with it? Right, so outside of just the, the automation that this means for the industry, there's an added, added layer of complexity when there might be a bit of a difference between the identities of the people being automated and the identities of those controlling those avatars or AI-generated people. So who has the right to control the identities that these AI models will represent? Uh, and should there be some sort of connection? Uh, or does this open up new layers and avenues for exploitation, a new world of kind of robust robot cultural appropriation, so to speak. Robot cultural appropriation. Can you explain that a little bit? Right. So uh, in, in kind of traditional terms, when uh, a, a non-dominant group or when a dominant group takes elements from a less dominant group and drives commercial benefit from it, we usually call that cultural appropriation. In a world with AI and avatars, that can become incredibly complicated. Uh, so if a, if a white male, for example, uh, owns and profits off of an AI-generated model who happens to be black and female, uh, is that an avenue for cultural appropriation in the digital age? Okay, and Joshua, if, if we're talking about the fashion industry, just as an example here, and, and maybe even makeup, this is another place where, where AI avatars are everywhere. It is, it is tough enough on your self-esteem to look at a perfectly photoshopped human, but at least you can reality check that, fact check that. Where is the potential for trouble with AI's place in those spheres? They can easily invent new people that not only not exist, but maybe are not even like plausible. Mm. I mean, uh, sometimes models you, you think are not plausible either, but, but it could be worsened. Um, and so, yeah, the, these, these are asking uh, difficult questions that we'll need to grapple with. And in, in specific terms, for you at night, you know, when you go to sleep, what is it specifically about AI that can keep you staring at the ceiling? What are the scenarios that concern you? Well, I'm, I'm worried for the stability of um, our societies. I'm worried about these tools being used to uh, influence people. I mean, people are already very influential, and we've seen with social media 
the effect of uh, trolls and so on. But imagine those trolls um, on a massive scale, so it's not limited by the number of people who work and you can be behind a keyboard. And, and Sinead, you know, you're, you're a futurist. I, I realize AI is with us right now, but best case scenario, so the flip side of this, in, in five years, how do you see it changing our lives? Hopefully, artificial intelligence is primarily a tool that's used to benefit humanity. Uh, it transforms healthcare um, and, and medicine and, and pharmaceuticals. It transforms education. It can be applied to, to climate change and, and sustainability. Uh, we can achieve a lot of great uh, new ideas and new explorations in space. There's a whole host of ways that this technology can really be on the right side of history and, and build a future that works for, for all of us or for, for at least most of us. But that's not something we're going to just arrive at without careful choice, uh, without continuing to have societal conversations and making sure it's not just a few people speaking on behalf of everyone. So that's interesting. You talked about being careful, but, but this is an unregulated space. I mean, I, th I think of it in terms of almost outer space where no one is actually in charge up there. And I suppose, Joshua, that's where this letter comes in that, that you and some 20,000 other people signed calling for this, this pause. I, I, I'm trying to figure out why some of the biggest companies in the world that are in AI would agree to a pause when they're operating in this sort of tantalizing, uh, unregulated space. Well, they, they might agree together because I think uh, the human beings behind those companies and uh, the AI researchers, many of them, I'm pretty sure, would welcome rules of the game that you know uh, make a, a level playing field. Um, that, that raise the, the bar on ethics and public protection. But, but if there is no uh, regulation and no agreement coordination between these companies, then it's, it's a race to the bottom. That's why we need um, an acceleration of the efforts to, um, to, to regulate. And that's what we're essentially calling for. I hear what you're saying, Joshua, but who can anyone hold accountable right now for, for what AI might be doing? Well, we already do these things in other sectors of society. Uh, people who build airplanes are accountable when, when something goes wrong and, and they have to document what they're doing, how they build the planes, how they make them safe. And the same thing could be done in AI. It's just that it hasn't been done before. And by the way, uh, Canada is probably going to be the first country to have a legislation um, that goes in this direction. And it, 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 the legislation that's proposed actually has very nice features. It's, it's, um, it's flexible, it's, it's adaptive, it's principles-based, and something that would be more difficult in the US, which means that the regulation can uh, adapt quickly when new dangers appear. Yeah, I think we have frameworks already. If you look at the pharmaceutical industry, R&D is encouraged, but when it comes to products interacting with, with humans and, and with citizens, there are protocols and, and steps of procedure that have to be followed, and there's a lot of spots of, of guidelines and regulation. So I think we have these models and frameworks. It's just about applying them now uh, to this emerging sector of AI. All right, Sinead Bovell and Joshua Bengio, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, a company is hoping to make Nova Scotia the new gateway to the final frontier. We're going to launch rockets from here? Is that a good idea? Is it? We have the answers next. Well, Canada is getting its first commercial spaceport. The project promises jobs, tourism, and exciting rocket launches for the very rural Nova Scotia community of Canso. But Tom Murphy wanted to know why there and why now. Here's what he found out. There are about 8,000 satellites above us right now, all of them put there by rockets. And believe it or not, the demand for more is only growing. Use a weather app, navigate with GPS, watch TV, you need satellites. Sure, Canada's been in the space game, but have we ever launched a rocket into Earth's orbit from our own soil? Nope. But now, in what will be a first for Canada, we're finally about to do it. Get ready for liftoff. Yeah, wait a minute. Um, we're gonna launch rockets from here? Is that a good idea? Mm. 
Meet Steve Mateer, a.k.a. Rocket Man, former NASA contractor, president, CEO, and pitchman for Maritime Launch Services. That's the company that is building Canada's first spaceport to launch commercial satellites. And this, Mateer says, is the perfect place from which to launch them. A chunk of crown land near the community of Canso in northeastern Nova Scotia. Not exactly the edge of Canada, but pretty darn close. And that's the whole idea. You know, you know, Rocket 101 is basically you got to make sure downrange is safe from anybody having parts falling on them. Florida works great if you're going in an equatorial platform because that's the direction they're facing. Um, but if you want to do in a polar orbits where people are wanting to put their satellites these days, you need to find a place with a polar reach. And some Canadian space heavyweights are on board who predict the global industry could grow to a trillion dollars annually by 2040. So the demand for spacecraft in orbit is only going to continue to grow for a very long time. So the countdown is on. In fact, construction of the roads to the future launch pad is underway as we speak. But there are also plenty of questions. This is the main rocket Maritime Launch is counting on, the Cyclone 4M. The plan is to launch it from a fixed platform to deliver up to 30 minibar fridge-sized satellites at a time. There, there, is that, there is that factor. I mean, having a rocket to launch is cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit less sexy now because, I mean, SpaceX is launching, you know, every four or five days. Right, SpaceX. You know Elon Musk. He has proven rockets launching satellites all the time. And that's something Maritime Launch Services does not have. Their Cyclone 4M has not even been fully built yet, nor has it been tested. Um, there are a couple of things that concern me about the, the Cyclone 4M. First of all, it's made in Ukraine. So, you know, their industry has been, you know, impacted, obviously, by the war. You know, this rocket is not completed. And so someone somewhere is going to have to step up and put up tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, to sort of get a fully operational version of this rocket going. But, but really, I think the most important thing would just actually to be to see a demonstration of it in flight. There can be rocket failures, and there probably would be. Um, I think one advantage of, of the site in Nova Scotia is that the facility is right by the water. And so the idea would be that it, it goes up and then almost immediately it begins going downrange. Still, any talk of that kind of thing scares some of the local people who are trying to kill the spaceport altogether, which really annoys the company. We're not just doing this. We're not, we're, not, we're not cowboys from New Mexico that have come up here to do something. The Cyclone 4 is in a family of Cyclone 2 and Cyclone 3 that has seen 228 launches over 30 plus years, 220 of over four of them successful, none of them having an issue on the ground. It's their heritage capability that has been upgraded to a Cyclone 4M that is based on technology that is very, very robust, that has been proven for decades, right? Okay, so another issue, all that space junk that satellites create. Does Canada really want to contribute to space pollution? Okay, I want to show you something. This depicts the amount of debris that's up there. That is a lot of junk in space. That, that blows me away. When you look at this, yeah, it can be alarming, but it's perspective as well. This is spread over, you know, 500 to 1500 kilometers in space, much, much further out. So there's a lot more space in space. Globally, we were launching maybe 100 satellites a year um, into space, and then it was 200, and now it's, <laughs> it's more than 1,000. And that number is going to continue to grow as we see the growth in these mega constellations. So we're putting a lot of stuff up there, and the question is, when do we reach sort of saturation where we completely junk up low Earth orbit? Um, I, I don't think the answer to that is known. Now, Canada doesn't even have federal legislation to regulate launches. So until it does, Maritime Launch will need environmental assessments for each launch on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no sonic boom that actually hits the mainland. 
um, because the sonic boom is directional in nature, so it travels with the rocket as it's leaving. So it'll glance off the ocean 40 or 50 miles offshore, uh, but it's not going to affect any of the neighbors or break any windows in that sense. So An entire year of launches from our location is significantly less uh, from, from an emissions perspective than a one day at Stanfield Airport here in Halifax. The propellants are spent. They're, 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 they're just aluminum and metal. Uh, that sink to the bottom of the ocean. But is it putting junk in the ocean? I mean, what, what would you say to people who are concerned about that? At the end of the day, it is a, a common practice globally still. And while that all could be somewhat disruptive, as the company puts it, it says think of all the economic benefits of having a spaceport in an economically depressed part of Nova Scotia, something like 50 to 100 full-time jobs. I think that that hype, that's pretty, that's pretty well overblown. There's been some studies of, of spaceport economic activities that have found that they're just these wonderful, wonderful places of economic activity. And then there's been some more realistic studies, I think, that, sh that shows that maybe it has the economic impact of a few fast food restaurants moving into a community. We're not doing this in a vacuum. Uh, this is really getting a lot of support and a lot of review and a lot of eyes on what we're doing to make sure that we're doing it right. I, I would just caution that it's technically very challenging. You know, there's been lots and lots of startups in the United States and elsewhere, and it has taken them longer and cost more money and, and often, very often resulted in failure. Which doesn't mean commercial rocket launches can't happen here. It just raises the question of how commercial they might really be. I think the bottom line is that for Canadian spaceport to be successful, you probably need some form of investment from the Canadian government. And the liftoff. So Tom, given all that, how likely is it that there will be a rocket launch from Nova Scotia, you know, anytime soon? Yeah, well, construction of that launch pad, no buildings or anything, but the pad itself has just been completed. And the company now says it plans to host a suborbital test launch of a much smaller rocket built by engineering students at York University, actually, in July. So just to test out the facility. Okay, so that's, that's the appetizer. What about the, you know, the bigger, higher orbital launches? When might they happen? Yeah, no firm date there. The company says it's signed agreements with several companies, but that's not exactly paying the bills. And so, like a lot of startups, Maritime Launch Services has some serious cash flow problems right now. The Cyclone 4M rocket they're counting on will not be ready for its first orbital launch. And the other rocket options they have do not have a proven track record, so there's all that. And as for taxpayers' money, well, the company says they have not received any to date, at mm. least at this point, Adrian. All right, Tom Murphy in Halifax, thank you. Next, a Scrabble champion breaks a glass ceiling. Oh, so she has guineas. And she found <laughs> it. Very nice, good find. Her secrets to Scrabble success in our moment. Well, these iconic size 13s are now officially the most expensive shoes ever sold at auction. Michael Jordan wore these Air Jordans during Game 2 of the 1998 NBA Finals. After the victory, he gave the signed shoes to a ball boy in the locker room as thanks for finding a lost jacket. They just sold for 2.9 million Canadian dollars. Here's another victory. Toronto's Ruth Lee spelled her way to success, becoming the first woman to win the North American High School Scrabble Championship. So earlier this month, she flew down to Washington, D.C. She knocked out the competition letter by letter. Want a few tips? Her strategy is our moment. Hi, I'm Ruth Lee. I'm a high school senior from Toronto, and I recently won the high school division of the North American School Scrabble Championship. What is it about Scrabble that, uh, that you like so much? I think it's just that I'm good at it. <laughs> <laughs> really? With, with this championship, you, you were the first woman to win, is that right? Yeah. I was honestly really surprised to find that out. There are a lot of very talented women who play Scrabble. I was surprised to learn that no other woman had won before. Oh, so she has guineas. And she found it. Very nice. Good find. What are your top three Scrabble tips? 
The first one、um, would be just learning the two-letter words.、Uh, my second tip would probably to be to just develop your anagramming skills, and then my third tip would just be to play a lot and develop the instinct for the game. So Ruth Lee, our 2023 high school North American School Scrabble champion, that is amazing. Congratulations, Ruth. I'm writing down these tips. Learn the the two letter words.、Uh, also, I really want to hear the color commentary for the Scrabble. And and Ruth said something interesting. You'd think you'd learn this at home, but she says surprisingly, her family doesn't play. That is a national for April the 12th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.